Astronomers. Popular astronomers, it's time to pop your astro. Good evening. Where has the starry sky gone? Where has the cosmic microwave backdrop gone? Uh, I will give you a clue as to where I am tonight. Um, it's very lovely here. Uh, very neat and pristine. I am back home at my mummy's house, yay! And I've had to relegate her to the upstairs bedroom with no internet whilst I do this show. So, uh, we're gonna play the countdown music now. Please start sharing the video while people join the feed. It helps with SPA outreach and algorithms greatly. If you share this video now while you're watching it live or if you are watching it in the future or in the past from now, hmm. And because I traveled on the train, what crazy lunatic, actually, is it the full moon tonight or is it tomorrow night? There's a beautiful lunatic full moon out there at the minute. It's stunning. Have you seen it yet? But what lunatic would travel with a mug on the train? Not me, which is why, I'm sorry, I've not got a mug to plug. I can't plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the big mug because I had to leave it behind because I would have been carrying some very heavy luggage. However, there might be potential price increases coming soon on our merchandise. Sing about the bling, plug the mug, all of our other apparel that we've got in the popastro.com shop. Um, if you're going to purchase it for... Christmases or winter weddings and winter birthdays. Purchase now to avoid disappointment. We have got comments in the chat room. Let's have a look. Ah, uh, Monsieur Kathy, Kathy and the Ragdolls. Good evening from I think the whole of Grand Britannia. It's cloudy at the minute. Although actually no, I say that I've seen the moon. Hi Tim. Good to have you, Jim. Great to have you. It is lovely to have you all. Oh, thank you. It's so nice to have you all along. Um, uh, great evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, Monsieur All and I is in Paris at the moment, I do believe. Good evening, citizen science out there. You might be interested in a new Planet Hunters project released today, mentioned on BBC Radio 4. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. M. Schwam, does that mean Megan Lamb is doing it? Uh, or is that her name? Oh, Megan Schwam, I'm sorry. It's a name I've not heard for a long time. Evening, Vicky. That's me. Lord Raymond Bill of Hogan Manor. Hi, Vicky. Renewed my SPA subscription this week. Still great value at £25. Great show, great society. Lord Raymond, thank you so much. And I hope that when you um, renewed your membership in the magic box where it said, where did you hear about the show? Please, I hope you tick the Vicky box. I really do. And if you are renewing your membership, please tick the Vicky box. It helps me greatly as well. Thank you very much. F Fisga Math. Oh, yes. Hello. Good evening. <laughs> wondered what you meant then. Thank you. It's very small font on my screen. Good evening from a rather damp North Yorkshire. Go and make a cup of tea and a puddle with lovely Yorkshire tea, David Graham. Hi. Very leaky sky. <laughs> it's crying. The sky is crying. Definitely no mooner. Okay. Um, yes, it's £25 a year to join. That is great value. And if you've watched us three times, please consider joining. It would help us out greatly. Um, it would be amazing for us. So yes, welcome to Pop Astro Live, Tuesday the 19th of October, 8pm, unless you're watching this in the future or in the past. Uh, tonight it's Moon Mysteries and Seekas Astro. Tonight it is a mind-warping excursion into the wildly improbable truths of science. That is our mission, and we have author John Gribbin to take us on that journey. He's written well over 100 books. I haven't even written over 100 pages. I've tried to write a book. It took me um, 10 months, and I didn't even finish the first page. It's so difficult, so kudos to anybody who's ever written a book, let alone over 100, uh, including one about Buddy Holly. Um, we're going to be reviewing his new book, Eight Improbable Possibilities, which covers... 
plug the rug more like. I've got a massive rocking horse table going on here. Um, how can I do this? No, I'd have to rearrange more furniture. You should see the state of the room. Look, right? Mum's up in bed and she is so incredibly pristine. I am not one of those people. And I've had to... I've had a bit of a trauma this evening, popular astronomers. I'll tell you about it later. I was meant to be at another location and I got there and the, sorry, Malk, his internet wasn't working at my astronomy teacher's house. And I had to bomb it back, tear my mum out of the lounge and look, I've done bad things to the lounge. I've removed pictures off the wall. There's a food blender on the couch. Betty Bamboogie, who you will meet in a little bit, is having a slump, but I've even rearranged the pictures. That is uh, South Stack Lighthouse in Anglesey uh, taken at night. So at least with, and there's a cockatoo there, a space parrot. So that is my life right now. Funny enough, Yorkshire tea is my favorite. I wouldn't expect anything less, to be honest, David. It is the best tea. It's so strong though, don't have it before bed, unless you get the caffeine-free version, which we have tried recently and we approve. Okay, so, um, yeah, we've got um, John and his um, book, Eight Improbable Possibilities, which co covers cosmological curiosities such as how we detect ripples and how all complex life on Earth is descended from a single cell. Society of the Week is a very, very last minute. Paul Tomset from South East Kent Astronomical Society, also known as CCAS, will be chatting with him any minute now. Um, wow, we've had some... Uh, this lineup and location for the show has changed more times than I ever remember it doing. We've been working on it right down to the last minute, this show tonight. So if any wheels fall off, blame Cosmo, who's not here. So, okay. Uh, good evening, Nigel. Good evening. Okay. We are now going to go over to Paul from South East Kent Astronomical Society. Cornish Smuggler's Brew. Is that tea? Is that tea? It sounds like it's going to leave you on your back, actually, and get your breathalyzed. <laughs> or is it a very strong local brew? Okay, we're going to go over to Paul now uh, in three, two, one. Good evening, Paul. I want a cup of tea now. I know, I want one as well. <laughs> I had to leave one. Uh, so I dashed to my... So I'm back home in Cheshire, and uh, my astronomy teacher, Malk, um, um, Malcolm Beasley of Mid Cheshire Astro and Mac Astro. Um, ow, cracked my fingers while saluting. Malk, thank you so much. And he made me a cup of my, or at least his son did. I got there to do my show. His son, uh, Ross, made me the most beautiful cup of my favourite tea, which is Earl Grey Hybrid oh, with Roy Bosch. No. In no, a no, pot. No, Earl Grey isn't tea. Like drinking oh, up. it's lovely. No, not. It is nice. Nah. It is nice. But this is a Earl Grey with Roy Bosch, and he brought it to me on a tray with and a teapot and a jug of milk, and I had to leave it. I had to rush, dash back home. So what's your tea of choice, Paul? Assam. Oh, now that is good. I'm a smoky Lapsang girl, but Assam is good as well. And it's not all that expensive either. Oh, that's it. All, always good. So, Paul, where are you this evening then? I'm sitting in my flat on the coast of Deal, right down on the okay. southeast Kent of England. Southeast and you, uh, of England, sorry, Kent. You are our Society of the Week, and what is your society? The Southeast Kent Astronomical Society, CCAS for short, as you've already mentioned. We formed in 1972. It was formed by a very keen young amateur astronomer called Paul Andrew, who is still our president, and he's our honorary mm -hmm. president. He's been a member, he's been the president forever. Um, he's had his finger in many astronomical pies over the years, including the foundation of the Federation for Astronomical Societies and lots and lots of other bits and pieces. Um, and he grew, as with all societies, it starts off with a band of, of like-minded people. And I think in the, in the early days, I, I joined it just after it formed, literally a couple of months after it formed. And I think there was about 15 members. And yeah. then we go to his mum's house in St. Margaret's Bay, which is a lovely little village around the corner from here. And telescopes were almost unheard of. And mm -hmm. Back in 72, telescopes, if you were to the telescope, you didn't just, I mean, like nowadays, I think the choice for amateur astronomers is phenomenal. But back in the, back in the day, um, they were prohibitively expensive, so we made our own. But CCAS grew from these monthly meetings at Paul's house to around about 35 members 
40 members and we moved to a, 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 a meeting hall in Dover and we got bigger and bigger. At one point we, had, we were the eighth biggest society in Britain. We had about 250 members. Oh, that really is big, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, had, how did you how did you manage to grow so big? We had a very active chairman, very proactive chairman, and he just put us out everywhere. We've done absolutely loads of outreach. And now I have to say a fair tranche of those members weren't necessarily South East Kent. Mm -hmm. But we, 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 we've now got down to about 100, give or take. Mm -hmm. And we hold it there now. We've been there like for a long, long time. So yeah. we're still the same chairman. I, over the years, have been on every position position in the committee. Uh, librarian, secretary, meetings officer, team maker, dog's body. Um, I've just literally stood down from being the society magazine editor. editor. We have a magazine called Eclipse that used to be an A4 publication posted out every quarter. Right. And, and then we went, uh, as with most things, we went digital. And it became an online magazine stroke newsletter. And I had the privilege of editing, editing it because uh, I don't know if all societies are the same, but you know, you, you ask for people to stand up and, and be uh, uh, taken a position on the committee and people just all look the other way and cough. And our editor, editor stood down and I could not see the magazine go down. I'm no, I'm no editor, but I took it on and I've done it for a few years, but I recently started a new job and, all sorts of things going on in my private life. So I've had to stand down only for a little while, but once my life settled down again, I'll take it on. Wow. So, so like, how much work does editing a magazine take? Because it's um, something I keep thinking I'd like to do, and then I think, oh, my gosh. It depends on how much you want to put into it. I was doing probably about two weeks a month. And towards the end of the month, that would get quite intense, and I might sometimes Ooh. be sitting up quite late. It doesn't have to be like that. Um. I, I would I would uh, lift a lot of stuff off of, off of our Facebook page, mm -hmm. but I would also encourage people to send me articles and bits and pieces. Now, I don't know you. You must have noticed this. But how long have you been interested in astronomy? I remember looking to Saturn uh, to a telescope at Saturn probably when I was about actually yeah maybe about twenty twenty one. Yeah, that's when the real love yeah. for it started. That's when I realised I could go astronomer bothering. Yeah. About three years ago, then. <laughs> yeah, less than well, that, you cheeky boy. <laughs> much less than that. So you must have noticed in, in your time that astronomy's gone from eyepieces to cameras. It's nearly it's an awful lot of astronomers nowadays will openly admit they're not astronomers; they're images, mm -hmm. and they know not they they don't know much about the night sky. Mm -hmm. Now, our society, CCAS, we've got. Um, a very large number of very, very excellent, dedicated images. Mm -hmm. And if ever I do talks and things to the society, I will always tear them a new spare hole because I'm um, I'm I'm old fashioned. I'm hands on. I like to draw what I see through the eyepiece and write about it. Oh, have you got any of your pictures that you could hold up just while you think on? Right. Don't go well. Two seconds. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to sing and dance. Um, sing and dance. Sing and dance. I'll do a song and dance about singing and dancing. Let's have a look. I keep meaning to. I started a local society down there that no longer exists. Thanet is genomical society for youth. And then Thanet. Am I pronouncing it right? Thanet to rhyme with Janet. It's not Thane, is it? No, it's Thanet. Just checking. Janet from Thanet. Amateur astronomers when we are. Oh, that's great, Paul. Well done. You need to join these people. Um, I, I have heard. Um, Paul, I, mean, I, I know Paul Sutherland anyway. Um, but no, I, um, I keep saying we, we need to get involved because um, there's a place in Thanet called Moncton Nature Reserve. Mm -hmm. And he'll know of these people. Now, many, many years ago, they contacted our society and said, we've been given a 12-inch telescope. So could yeah. we possibly give them a hand? And we, we went down and looked at it and we ended up building a 30-foot dome for them. Ooh. And for 12 years, we maintained it, we used it, and we we done public observing and stuff. But these these sketches are pretty old, so I've not really had a chance to go out and do much lately. But that's, that's M51. Oh, let's get in the right position. Uh, M51. I've only got a couple in here because I'm not... M82. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Uh... Some of these aren't really that very well known. 
This was um, M81 with the Supernova back in 1993. And even the smallest little sketch can really help increase your understanding of the layout and the identification of an yeah. object. Do you remember, um, I believe that was Comet Hayakutaki. Hayakutaki, I remember that. I was about 17 or 18 at the time, going out clubbing I mean, that with was, Smiths. That was absolutely massive. But, it um, was great. So within the society, I'm always trying to promote stargazing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there we go. Moncton Stargazers going strong, and they've got a fantastic setup. They've got a bit, I mean, I can be biased and say the dome's superb because we did um, we did build it with them. But they, they've got a beautiful 12 inch telescope here, and they've got, um, I don't know if they still got it, they had an automated telescope next door, right next door to the, to the dome that we created. It's a lovely site, and they're lovely people, and they have, they have meetings and, and to talks for people, and they're very down to earth. And I, do, I must admit, we would like to have more ties with them. I think the Thanet lot are brilliant. But um, we have our own observatory uh, up, up near Canterbury. We, we built it, um, well, it must be about 10 years ago now, eight, 10 years ago now. And we have a, a very nice 11 inch Schmidt Cassie grain. Uh, but someone, someone donated a six inch refractor, which is one of the most beautiful telescopes I've ever seen through. Oh, beautiful. It just, this guy was on, on Facebook somewhere saying I'm going to sell it and nobody would buy it or whatever. So we approached and said, would you like it? So we went and picked it up. And then every time we, you know, every now and again, we'll go and pick the chap up and bring him down. We'll put his, his telescope on our mount and he can view through it. But the views of the planets are absolutely breathtaking. Mm, nice, nice. But we had a, um, we had a 25th birthday party back in 97. And it's held at the University of Kent in Canterbury, which is where I now work. Ooh. And I was given the job of getting the, the, the five main speakers for that event. Mm -hmm. And we'd all been down to see Patrick Moore, and he always gives you his phone number. Right. So, so I rang in first, and he said, yep. So we got Patrick Moore. I also got Paul Money, who's up for, he's, he's up Yorkshire way somewhere. Um, and he's incredibly contagious. He's brilliant. Very entertaining. Um, Paul, have you heard of Paul Murdin? I've not heard of Paul Murdin, no. Paul Murdin was, was um, I mean, very much, very, very big in the world of um, supernovae and and, and stuff. Um, he's, he's knocking on a wee bit now. Um, we had uh, John Zarnecki, Patrick Moore and Alan Chapman. Now, if Lovely. you ever get a chance to go and see Alan Chapman, he's always down at the Astro Fest at, um, in Kensington in February. He's our favourite. Actually, I've ne never thought about getting him on this show, actually, if, if, he's, if he's even got the internet. I'm sure he has. I, should, you know, I, I think he's, he's, he's a bit wiser than you'd think. Uh, <laughs> he, was, he was brilliant. He, I'm not, I, the guy mesmerises me. I, I've got a photograph of me all the way out there, me with him. Um, oh, uh, that's so he, lovely. You're the man. But um, when we booked Patrick Moore, done all the advertising, sold every single ticket, and he rang me up a month before the gig and said, I can't make it. Ooh. So, I went, well, we got to because it's all done. So he blithered around. Then he come back to me a little while. He said, no, it's all right. I'm sorted. I'm coming. I said, don't forget, we're going to pick you up from South Sea. We're going to run you around and we'll put you in a hotel. Or we'll take you home that night, whatever you want. And a week before the gig, he rang up, can't come. But I've got him in the end. Yes. He double booked himself. But oh. um, that was probably Seacash's sort of crowning moment because shortly after that our, our profile really went through the roof we was on the telly and all sorts that's great but years, ago, was, but years ago you used to have lots of societies having at these conventions and you hardly hear of them now i mean i mentioned mm. astro fest down in kensington but all the biggest societies always had every year you go somewhere to an astronomy convention and you have trade stands and talks and it's brilliant Sorry, I'm just reading Paul's comment. What did you say? Uh, he ate eight cakes. Well, when he come to ours, um, <laughs> we know he's partial to a shot of whiskey. Right. So did, he have, whiskey. did he have eight of them? <laughs> oh, he had a few. So we took him to the green room, the designated green room, <laughs> and I went in to make sure he was all right. And I got this, and I said, would you like a, would you like a, a little sniff, though? So, yeah. So I said, just say when. 
and it came down, <laughs> was getting deeper and deeper in this glass. And then he said, stop. I said, do you want some water? He said, no, no, better not. Then I'll drown it. Anyway, <laughs> I left and one of my mates went in there and he'd come back afterwards. He said, God, he said, have you seen the size of that glass of scotch he's got? I didn't tell him it was me that poured it. <laughs> and he was absolutely superb. Absolutely oh, that's superb. great. Thank you, Paul. So tell us a little bit about uh, your society when you meet um, and how we get involved. Right. You can you. you can find us at, uh, if you go onto Facebook, we have a, an outreach page. Look for CCAS um, Outreach, and we're on there. Or you can just go www.sekas.co.uk, and it'll take you to our web page. You know, I, th- I do believe the web page has got links to uh, our Facebook site. Um, obviously, the code. Are, are you meeting? Are you meeting yet? We've just started now. Uh, obviously, the COVID put a, put paid to that. But we, we generally meet on the second Saturday of every month in a, a village hall out between Folkestone and Dover, a little village called Olcombe. Right. So um, and we have we have seven thirty till half past nine ish. We'll have we'll have uh, the guest speaker. We always we, we always have nine times out of ten we'll have a good guest speaker. Uh-huh. Then we'll have a break, and then one of our members comes on and does um uh he does like a. a a monthly sky law thing and he's always but alan snook he's retired now um and he's he's just getting out he's, he's got a 20 inch dobsonian and he's just getting out an observatory with a, a 14 inch smith cassie grain and he'll do a talk about what's happening in the, in the in the weeks ahead and he always sets a little task at the end of every meeting um the meetings are always very well populated it's great when you go and we have a speaker, and the hall's got a lot of people in there. So that's on the second Saturday of every month. Um, right. Oh, Saturday we, meetings, that's nice. Yeah, it's unusual, because apparently most other societies seem to have midweek meetings. But we they also sure do. We also uh, try to organise um, a monthly meeting at our observatory. But the observatory is open to any member. If they want to go down, there's certain regulations, you can't go on your own. But if you want to go to the observatory, make a phone call, someone will come with you. And you can use observatory telescopes, the eyepieces. We've also got a 14-inch Dobsonian in there, which is rather nice. Oh, um, nice. And then we do a lot of outreach. We do um, all the all the local cub groups, scout groups. Um, in fact, I'm doing a scout group on on um, Friday in Hearn Bay. Uh-huh. And my, my colleague who's, who's invited me to do it has warned me they're, um, they're dangerous. So I'm looking forward to that one. But we can we go to all the schools. We're often getting asked to go to schools and do so. We've got a we've got a small core of members that will go along to all the outreach things, and we'll take yeah. a collection of our our society telescopes, and uh-huh. just show people around the night sky and introduce them to the world of amateur astronomy. Mm-hmm. Mm. That is so cool. So, um, thank you so much for that. Tell us about your involvement with Kelling Heath. Oh, Kelling Heath. Now, I, we spoke before about this earlier on. Kelling Heath is an astro camp. And it's twice a year. On the equinoxes. Now, if you get again, go into Google and just search out uh, Kelling Heath Star Party, and uh-huh. it runs for a week. But generally speaking, you'll book from the Thursday to the following Sunday. Um, the spring one's very nice, but the the September one or the October one, depending on when it is, um, uh-huh. you have a lot of guest speakers on the Saturday. You have a massive great raffle. You have uh, trade stands, and at the back of the it's, it's a very very nice campsite there's hookups excellent uh-huh. facilities there's a restaurant bar swimming pool uh-huh. saunas gym um but the back end is dedicated to the big telescopes you call it telescope row yeah and you go down there and you walk around anywhere in the site and look through anyone's telescope so during the day it's clear there are people with solar telescopes and at night you'll have a, 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 a array of telescopes up to 30 inch reflectors you can go and look through but Kelling right. Heath, if you are interested in amateur astronomy, you haven't got to be a, a, a rocket scientist. If you just enjoy the night sky, Kelling Heath is just the best place to go. And if it is dark and clear, it's supremely clear. It's beautiful. Paul, thank you so much. Now, there's a, a slight surprise I need to spring on you now. And uh, according to some, it might not be a very pleasant surprise. Are you ready? Go on. <laughs> uh, we have a quiz this is not my name, Paul Sutherland devised the name. It's called Universe Witty Challenge, where we ask you 
five astronomy questions um, um, to go on the leaderboard. Currently in first place, we've got Owen Gwynn of Mid Cheshire Astro with three out of five. Um, Swindon Stargazers are on two out of four because I've missed out a question and I still need to get him back on for one more question. So are you up for it? Go on, give it a go. Great. Okay. Right, let me just set my little screen up here. I need some dramatic music to play, really. Okay, there's a bro what's your particular um, area of astronomy, Paul? Um, galaxies, comets, and meteors. Oh, well, good luck. You're in luck then. Hopefully, you should get all these questions right. Yeah, that's it. Set it up. <laughs> uh, okay, question number one What would you find at the center of a planetary nebula? A progenitor. Oh, a progenitor. Yeah, the, star at, that's the, yeah, the star at the heart of a planetary nebula is a progenitor. Is that the same as a white dwarf? It depends. Uh, well, yes. But it's, just, it's remnants of the star that created the planetary nebula. It's the core of the star. It's generally, well, known, as, it's generally known as a progenitor. You can have an extra half a point for that because that wasn't the answer I got, but you could one one above, so it's one and a half. Well done for <laughs> well done for educating me. Now you see, I've had to um ask my astronomy teacher Malk to write these for me while I was dashing back <laughs> here. Um, um because I would have written them myself, and obviously I would have known that had I written the questions, of course. <laughs> okay, question number two. How is the Einstein cross formed? Gravitational lensing. Oh, you spot well, on. You make my life easy when you say what I've got written down here. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> if you can feel free to elaborate. I've just, funny enough, I was at Kelling Heath and I just at this observing guide. Yeah. Um, observing small galaxy groups. And huh? one of them's got, includes gravitationally lensed quasars. Beautiful, beautiful. If you could see any of those from Kelling Heath, I'd be very impressed. 3C273. You can see that through most telescopes. Most distant objects oh. you can see with a telescope in your back garden. That is amazing, and I didn't know that. But then again, this is why the SPA is all about uh, accepting people from all levels. So my yeah. astronomy knowledge astronomy. isn't up there. Astronomy is what you want it to be. Oh, that's nice. I like that. That's very good. Okay, well, they're great answers so far. What is coming back to visitors next month? Next month. Uh, the 11th and 12th of November. The 12th of November is my birthday. Yeah, well, guess what you're going to have in the sky? It's going to be a comet, I take it. Uh, who might it be? Oh, is it Comet Enki? I'm afraid you're wrong. Oh, it's no. 67P Churumayov. Oh, God, it's been ages since I've said it. Let's do it syllable by syllable. Churumayov Gerasimenko. The rubber duck. The rubber ducky. Yay. So you didn't get that one right. So that's two out of however many I've asked you. And yeah, um, what happened the last time it passed by? We landed a probe on it. Name that probe. Um, New Horizons went to Pluto. Um, do you know what I can't, I can't remember? Because it was in two uh, arms. Because the, the probe actually landed, but it bounced higher than they thought, and they lost it. it ended up landing, it, landing in the neck. It was the Rosetta probe, and Rosetta. it dropped. The, attempted to drop the Philae um, uh, lander. Yeah. Beautiful, oh, well. beautiful. Okay, the last one, the last question. You're doing really well so far. You've given great answers. The last question. Is it a crater or is it a potato? Moon crater or earth potato? Are you ready? Go on, him. It's got a great name. Sausage jeans. <laughs> hey? Sausage jeans. It's spelled. I'll put it in the game. I'll put it on the screen now. It's spelled. It's spelled. Um, sausage jeans. <laughs> That's a crater. You are absolutely correct. Well done. It's a lunar impact crater 
on the west edge of Mare Tranquillata Tatatus. That's where man first landed, Tranquility. Well done, well done. That is so great. You have got, let me tot up your scores. You got one right, you got two right. You got three out of five. Three and a half out of five. Three and a half out of five. <laughs> you have done really, really well. They were great answers. Paul, it's been a pleasure to have you on and um, and um, good luck. And I'll send you the link to this and you can distribute it to your society and um, tell them, spread the good word of the SPA. I will do. Thank you very much. All right, Paul. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming on last minute. My pleasure always. Anytime, give me a shout. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yes, that was great. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Okay, motoring on with the show. Um, I have to thank you, Paul. Great talk, it was really half a pound of sausage in this, please. There we go. Sausage knees to all the schoolboys. Sausage knees to all schoolboys. That sounds dubious. <laughs> okay, news of our imaging competition. Have I done a banner for it? Let's have a look. I don't think I have. Imaging contest, imaging contest guess what we're starting with an imaging contest everybody it's cassiopeia i'm gonna spell it wrong aren't i cassiopeia there we go so what we'd really like you to do i hope i spelt it right it's all on the fly tonight the show is what we'd like you to do is try your best to get a beautiful image of cassiopeia it is resplendent in the sky at the minute it's the one that looks like a whir. Should you just be learning about it? Because as you know, the SPA welcomes astronomers and sky gazers of all levels. Cassiopeia is a constellation in the northern sky named after the vain queen Cassiopeia, mother of Andromeda, uh, who boasted about her unrivaled beauty. She was one of 48 constellations um, listed by the uh, Greek astronomer Ptolemy and uh, it remains one of the 88 modern constellations today. It's easily recognisable due to its distinctive whoosh shape formed by five bright stars. And if you could take a picture of it, now you could cheat and use uh, an old picture, but it'd be really nice if you could help us out and take one fresh for this competition. Take it on your phone, take it on your most amazing gear, take it on a remote telescope, do something fantastic with it. Uh, the prize is, something that i really really want it's either going to be a mug from the spa with an image of venus on it or better still one with an image of the planet that's name i always get wrong in a big freudian slip uranus i said it right i said it right i said it right and you send that your quiz are your your uh, entries to competition at popastro.com they've splashed out you've got me an email address the budget here knows no ends. Right, let's have a look at the comments. Thanks, Paul. You were a brilliant guest. Yes, he was brilliant. Um, that's come out twice, that comment has. I rem I remember my father remarking on that clever name when Patrick visited. He said it was a complete coincidence. Okay, not with you there, Paul. Okay, thank you all. Paul says thank you. Paul Tomset said thank you all. Okay. We're now going to go over to our second guest, Mr. Gribbin. Are you ready to join us? Um, oh, wow. Do you know what I'd really like to do is just have a five minute break, but I can't. <laughs> I need to motor on. You know, when your brain just gets like that static. Uh, we'll let John do some talking in a minute. Here he comes. Wow. Today is a day where I think I've done more things in my life than ever before. Here's John. Hello, um, John. I can, I can always talk for five minutes easily. I can I can start by taking issue with that progenitor thing. I don't agree oh. with Paul about that. I put the progenitor is the star that's there before it explodes. What's oh. left is the white dwarf. So you know, cudgels at dawn. I think. And I'm going to have to debate that half a point, that hard battle oh, half a yeah. point. And it has put Seacass into the lead by it half a point now. So crazy. yeah. It could be very, very crucial. Um, I like this. What do we think? Is it a progenitor or is it not? Um, thank you. Paul, tell it, uh, sorry, John, tell us where you are this evening. Well, I've, I've been uh, writing a book, which I, as you know, I do occasionally. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> here it is. Way. Yay. What a and beautiful little uh, book. It's about, um, it's about things that uh, sound too strange to be true, uh, but, but mm. actually are true. And I, I lifted the title from the famous quote in the Sherlock Holmes books where 
Sherlock Holmes is, the, the words are put into his mouth by Conan Doyle. Uh, he says, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, how improbable must be the truth. Uh, and so these one, are some astronomical and some other scientific things that you look at and you think that can't possibly be true, but everything else is eliminated. So, so it must be true. At least it looks plausible. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Right, I've been doing this show for about 18 months and the internet connection has been a long running hassle because um, uh, you need quite good bandwidth for this. Just before I came on, the upload was only seven and the, the little poor, poor winky light, poor internet light was flashing and I thought, oh God, it's going to be rubbish again. But I'm so glad to hear it's good. So John, um, tell us, um, yeah, good work on the book. Go into a little bit more detail about the astronomical yeah. mysteries that you revealed in it. Well, the whole, the whole thing sort of kicks off with the moon. So that's, um, you know, a, a pretty good astronomical connection. Uh, and the, the improbable thing about the moon, which is, obvious to anyone who's ever been interested in the night sky is that during a solar eclipse the moon is exactly the right size to exactly fit over the sun and it's because of that that we get the spectacular displays able to see the corona flares if you're lucky and all kinds of stuff but this is something that is is a unique moment in geological astronomical time because long ago when the moon formed it was closer to the earth so it looked bigger and it would have blotted the sun out completely. And in the not too distant future, in terms of astronomical time, the moon will be further away from us and it'll be too small to block the sun out at all. It'll just be a, a little dot passing across the front. So the, the improbable and strange coincidence is that intelligent beings are around to look up at the sky and notice this amazing phenomenon just at the moment in geological time out of tens of billions of years when it's actually there to be noticed. Yes, thank you. I was just thinking, what are the chances? What would what odds would William Hill give I, on that? Do you think? Yeah, I I don't know about odds. I mean, it it just seems am, am, amazingly unlikely. I mean, you think we've only been around for, you know, if you stretch it, if you said maybe a a million years at the most, you know, and the the sun's been going for. Four and a half billion so far, got another four and a half billion to go. So I suppose on that basis, the odds are sort of one, one million in 10 billion uh, against the, 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 such a, a thing being possible. And it's also, it, it's interesting as well, because our moon is by far the biggest in proportion to the size of its parent planet uh, of all the moons in the solar system. So it's, it's an interesting object in its own right. And it's probably quite well known now that, that the most plausible explanation is that it formed when an object about the size of Mars hit the Earth early on in the formation of the solar system and a large chunk of the Earth was sort of ripped out and formed a, a ring around the planet and that ring coalesced to, to form the moon uh, and that's why it, it, it's in effect we, we have a, a double planet if, if you're a visitor from another planet looking at the Earth moon system, you probably wouldn't call it a, a, a planet and a moon, you'd call it a double planet, just as in fact the Pluto system really ought to be called a double planet if you're going to call it a planet at all, which is controversial in itself. Um, yes, so how long will it be then before the uh, eclipses stop being perfect to our eyes? Well, it not, um, certainly a, a few million years, you know, not, not a billion years, um, much less than that. Um, so, you know, and if, if we're still around to see it, we'll be doing very well in terms of uh, human civilization and how long species usually hang around on the planet. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. So tell us about um, your other astronomical mysteries. Well, that you've the, one, in the one that's my, my personal favourite is uh, the story about uh, Isaac Newton, a bishop and a bucket of water, which is, you know, sounds like the beginning of, of a, a story that's going to end up with a joke. But it's not. It's, it's the absolute truth. Uh, and uh, the, the details, of course, are in the book. But the, the story is about Newton noticing that if you have a bucket of water, and he, he actually did the experiment, it's very important. Newton wasn't a you know, sort of pie in the sky theorist like me, he actually did the experiments. And you, you hang a bucket of water from a long rope and you twist it up round and round, you know, and then you let go. First, the bucket starts moving and the water stays flat. And then friction makes the water rotate and the water develops a curved surface. And then 
you stop the bucket, the water carries on spinning and stays with a curved surface, then it slows down and stops. So how does the water know that it's spinning? Why does the, the water dip in the middle? And, and Newton's answer is that it's, it's because there are, uh, there's a connection, what, it, what it's measuring itself relative to is what he called the fixed stars, what we'd now say distant galaxies. It's not rotating relative to the bucket that matters. It's not the buckets rotating that matters. What matters is the way the water, the liquid is moving relative to the universe at large. And exactly the same thing, you were, you were swigging a cup of tea earlier. When you stir your tea, you get the same effect. There's a dip in the middle. You know, how does the tea know? Why does it dip? It dips because it knows it's rotating relative to the whole universe. And this is something that intrigued Einstein. And he tried to incorporate this idea, which is became known as Marx principle after a, another physicist philosopher. He tried to incorporate this into his general theory. And it's one of the reasons that he, the, the way he built in the ideas about space and time, curvature of space and all of those things. And, and it's um, in some sense, it's not properly explained even yet, but in, in, in another sense, the, the general theory does go some considerable way towards explaining it. So if you, you sit down, you know, you get a cup of tea or coffee, give it a good stir and watch the dip form. And that, that dip is happening because the rest of the universe exists. And if there was no rest of the universe, you know, if there was a cup of tea floating in space and you tried to stir it, it would go round and round, but it wouldn't make a dip because it wouldn't know that there was anything outside to force it to dip. Your head hurts. It's not often, it's yeah. not often a guest makes me pull that uh, <laughs> face. I, I, well, it, it, it's, it's, it's people, that's why these things, you know, it sounds so improbable and it's so improbable that people don't think about it. You know, the, the, the relativists don't think about it. A few of them do, but most of them just sort of go along, use the equations, you know, calculate how to see gravitational lenses and Einstein cross and all of those sorts of things. And they, they don't sort of stand back and say, well, this is really something amazing and fundamental and important about the universe. And it, it, you can scale it up. You know, it's not just cups of tea. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, it's, it's a flat disk and, and it's a flat disk because it's rotating. And how does how does the galaxy know it's rotating? It knows it's rotating because there are all the other galaxies out there and in some sense sort of that they're interacting. And of course it fits in with, with Einstein's ideas because you have the idea of the whole fabric of space and time being, you know, the, the, the analogy everyone loves, the rubber sheet that's stretched out and you can make ripples by bouncing things up and down on it. And if you think that that rubber sheet of space time, its shape, if you like, is made by all the matter in all the galaxies and now we'd say all the dark matter as well, all of that working together is what makes the shape of space here, you know, everywhere. So that's how it knows. It's because it's actually a thing like a cup of tea or a planet or a galaxy is actually set inside the space that's created by all the other matter in the universe. And that's something that um, is obviously fundamentally important and nobody fully understands. That's the fun John. Side. Why are you talking to me saying, oh, listen, my head's reeling. I've got this <laughs> light in my face and it's like, it's my new little light. And I feel like I'm being interrogated by the no, universe here. Absolutely. They have days of making you think, yeah. wow. Well, that, that's it. I mean, these, these, these are little short, you know, this, there's a little ditty book and there's eight little ditty chapters in. There's nothing frightening, you know. I can I can talk about each one for an hour, but I, you don't need an hour to read them. Uh, and the idea is you, you can think about it and go, my Lord, I never thought of that. And why doesn't people uh, take it more seriously? And then you can follow it up. There's lots of references and things if you're seriously interested in it. How much is the book to do with quantum physics? Very little, because the, I mean, I've written a lot about quantum physics and, and people oh. might be surprised that I'm not this time. Um, okay. But that's because... Um, I'll put it like this, quantum, it's not surprising that quantum physics is surprising, if you see what I mean. You know, <laughs> okay. Everybody knows quantum physics is crazy. So I wanted to write about things that you don't expect to be crazy, like cups of tea and, and things like that, and why the moon is 
the same size on the sky as the sun is. Um, but I, I, I do do chaos theory if you want something fancy. Please got, tell us about it. We would know, love to know about that, <laughs> wouldn't we? <laughs> well, chaos theory, I mean, everybody's heard of the butterfly effect and, and it's usually um, what you've heard is usually wrong. But but what it says is that that sometimes things are what's called sensitive to initial conditions, which means that if you give them a little prod one way, they'll move a long way. And if you give them a little prod the other way, they'll go a long way that way. And you can't tell which way it's going to go until you prod it. And the example I like to use is somewhere at the top of the Rocky Mountains in North America, you know, there, there's a, a what's called the watershed. And, and there's a point where a drop of rain falling on that point, if it falls a millimetre this side, it'll go to the Pacific Ocean. If it falls a millimetre the other side, it'll go down to the Gulf of Mexico. And that's sensitive to, to where the raindrop falls. And it, it comes into weather forecasting, which is, is where chaos theory was originally discovered. Um, sometimes weather systems are very sensitive to, to the initial conditions, and sometimes they're not. So when people do, you know, the Met Office does a big weather forecast for five days ahead, they'll, they'll run it with their best measurements of temperature and pressure and all that stuff today then they'll run the model for five days and see where they get to then they'll change the starting numbers by a little bit and run it again and see if they get more or less the same answer and if they do then at that particular moment in time the the, the, the weather systems are not sensitive and the forecast is a good one and if you get two completely different forecasts you can't say which one's right all you can say is the weather's in a messy state at the moment and, and we don't know how it's going to turn up. And, and this is um, it, 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 it's something that, that sort of strikes right at the heart of predicting anything. You know, and questions like, uh, is there free will? You know, does the universe know where it's going, if you like, and stuff like that. Ooh, what, do, what, what are your thoughts on that, actually? Because <laughs> well, I do lie in bed. That's a kind of stupid, well, not stupid, but the thing that does no, keep you awake. It, 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 the, the, the simple answer, I think, is that the universe probably does know where it's going, but there's no way you can tell be, because of this um, sense sensitivity. And I can, I can give an example closer to home, and then I'll come back to that. If, if you look at the, um, the orbit of the, the Earth around the sun, it's, it's chaotic in the sense that you can't predict it in detail, but it's not very chaotic. And people have done simulations where you... You, you set up all the parameters and planets and the gravity and the forces between them and the sun. And you start with the Earth where it is today and you run this simulation for 100 million years of simulated time and find out where the Earth is in its orbit. And then you move this starting position by five meters. They, they, they've literally done this. So it's like take the Earth today and then imagine it five meters further around the orbit. You run the simulation again and you you don't get the same answer. It's not five meters different in 100 million time. You find that that bigger change now means it could end up anywhere in its orbit. So all you can say is it's stable in the sense that it won't have fallen into the sun or anything like that. But in 100 million years time, the Earth could be anywhere in its present orbit and we can't say where. So the universe can, the universe knows if you like, because, because the universe has got everything built into it. But the only simulation that can simulate the universe is the universe itself. You'll, you'll never be able to build a computer that can simulate what's going to happen in detail to even the small part of the universe. You know, the, the, only, the only simulation of the Milky Way galaxy is the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, so, yeah, I think it, it's quite plausible that there's no free will and, and, and everything is predetermined, but we cannot possibly know uh, and we cannot possibly predict it. We can't say if that's the case, we could, you know, write down the numbers for the position of every atom in the universe and, you know, calculate the future from that because it's too sensitive. Does that make sense? You look baffled again. No, I'm not baffled. I, I followed that. I got one right. I followed that. I was more just having visions of like what happens when you're speaking to people in the pub and they don't expect this information rush from you and you start talking yeah. about that. I bet they <laughs> <laughs> What happens when you unleash that power? 
people I talk to usually know what to expect, but but in the pub I'm more likely to talk about Buddy Holly or something like that, or cricket. Ah, yeah. the crickets or just Buddy Holly? And cricket, yeah, yeah, both of them. <laughs> Or football, so, yeah, yeah. I take I take my grandson to see uh, Lewis Football Club a lot, so that that's a that's a big hobby part time. Ah, yeah. I would like to sit in the pub with you. It could be arranged. It could be. It could be. Wow, well, John, thank I'm you so much. The South Coast. I'm I'm near nearer to Paul. I'm just just along the road from Sussex ah. again. John, thank you so much for coming on and uh, wrecking my head. That's all right. Anytime. This might Anytime. <laughs> well, actually, what we'll do when we're finished is I'll ping you an email with a link and thanks and what have you, and then we'll get you booked in maybe three to six months from now. So yeah, that, helps me, yeah. that helps me immensely with my diary. No problem. Thanks. Before you go, just hold your book up to the screen, tell us all about it, and um, I'm sure, is it available well, on, on Amazon? I'm, I'm um, sorry it's such right. a pale cover. I think they should have put the lettering in red or black, but then that's published right for you. It's right eight, up. eight Improbable Things. It's uh, published by Icon, who are lovely people, and I recommend them to anyone who has got a really good idea for a book. Uh, and it's out now, and as you can see, it's not it's not very fat. You know, it's It's easy to read. You can read a chapter a day and then um, put it away and get one of my other books. Um, okay, let's just have a look here. Monsieur Ull and I, I have so many questions, but they will be a page long. I bet you do, because I know my, my French friend is very much into what you're doing. Maybe he could read some of your previous books. What book would you recommend, John? Depends what you're interested in. I mean, I did a, 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 a book which I, I like called 13.8, the number, which is about how we know the age of the universe and stars and things like that. And that brings in loads and loads of uh, astrophysics. I mean, that that's my background. I'm not a looker through a telescope person. I'm, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist. So I, I can, I do know Cassiopeia, uh, but that's one of the <laughs> very few that I can recognize. Oh, you'll have to join the SPA and get your knowledge yeah, up to I'll, speed. I'll get my phone out and uh, sneak out there. Thank you so much, John. It's been an absolute pleasure. Do we have any last minute questions? I'll do a countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, <laughs> 6. Any, oh, wait, yeah, it is one. For a future question, has John any opinion on the universe being two dimensional, a hypersphere? Yeah. Take it away. We'll, we'll do that in six months' time. How about that? That, that, that I'll, I'll bone up on it and I'll be ready to uh, take a serious look at it. Uh, Jed says, Thank you, Jed. One of our regulars. Um, thank you, John. Have several of your books would recommend. That is great. Thanks, John. Thank that was mind blowing. Have ordered you. your book. Thanks. Very good. Thank you, John. It was a delight. See you soon. Cheers. Bye. Oh, hi, Sonia. It, it was 19 degrees today. I bought a massive new trench coat today and uh, it was not a good day to wear it. Um, evening, going to be a bit stormy tomorrow for Western parts. Still mild, going to turn colder, then a bit clearer later on in the week. Sonia, thank you so much. Can you come on in a week or two? Let me know when is good for you and I hope you're feeling better after your um, little COVID adventure. Fascinating talk, John. Don't necessarily understand it all but enjoy anything to do with the universe. Oh, thank you, Bartek. I'm not recognising your name and it's very nice to have you on and we would love you to submit your Cassiopeia picture, John. Uh, Bartek, sorry. Okay. Can I have some water now, please? Oh, wow. I actually think today might have been the most hectic, crazy, amazing, brilliant day of my entire life. I've had so much wonderful stuff happen to me and then right at the end of it, craziness caused by internet failure and having to sprint to between two destinations and set up a show with many last minute alterations to this show. Yeah, Sonia, getting there, feeling very tired. Now, I keep seeing people on my Facebook and Twitter who've been jabbed, youngish people who've had COVID, and they're really, really, really poorly from it. Uh, one of my friends said it was so scary, even after a jab. So look after yourselves out there. Um, I do like to wear my mask, to be honest. It is quite scary. And, the, you know, when you're self-employed like me, or you're running a, a business, or you've got a family, or you've got, you know, you can't afford to have 
to be poorly. You just can't afford to be. And it seems that COVID can really, really knock you for six and take a huge chunk out of your life, despite the jabs. Um, and also, um, a friend of mine still hasn't got his sense of taste or smell back after a year and he's gutted. Last week's speaker, Oh, Owen, wow. Oh, my God. It's just so virile and still there. Interesting talk. Rosanella, my brain hurts. So does mine. Let's join the Headache Club. Rosanella, DC, I don't recognize your name either. If you are a first-time visitor to the show, welcome. It's great to have you here. You're new, that's why. Oh, thank you, Bartek. Do come and play with us every week. Be a regular in the chat room. Thank you, Paul. Paul, honestly, Paul Fuzzle and Pithy comments. Paul and Robin have helped me out so much with this new iteration of the show. And um, thank you for, I don't know, like my email thread off YouTube is dozens and dozens of emails long. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Robin. Now guess what we've got coming up? A photo of, hello, Mel Gig. A photo of Cassie Appear is a great opportunity to include the asterism Eddie's coaster. I was at Eddie Carpenter's celebration of his life memorial just now. Who's Eddie Coaster? I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. Very good. Now, to new viewers, I am usually in a different location, 100 miles away uh, in, in my house. And I usually have a little sidekick called Cosmo, the telescope sloth. Cosmo is actually quite heavy because he's full of beans, literally. Um, I couldn't bring him with all my heavy gear. And so basically, I'm Cosmo-less. But that's okay. We've got a stunt double for Cosmo. Cosmo does a little competition each week and um, here it comes. Let me just grab the Cosmo song. It's here somewhere. I've not written a song for ages. I'll have to do a song for you. Come on, where's the Cosmo, Cosmo theme? Here it is. He's in flying around the solar system or maybe a bit further. But to the casual observer, he's a mithering, pestering sloth. <laughs> Where have you been to this week, Cosmo? Cosmo, where have you been? Three clues. Only answer after the clues. Cosmo over and out. Hi, uh, Bartek. Um, I'll let me see if this email will cut and paste. There it is. Competition at popastro.com. Um, Somebody feel free to drop Bartek um, an email, uh, a, a, a direct message with that on. Um, it's competition at popastro.com. So what we do every week is our little resident sloth jets off around the solar system. I'm sorry, I'm in the most uncomfortable angle. What if I just was like this on the couch? My neck is... Oh, the fairy lights are in. Okay, that is comfy. That is a relaxed way to do a show. So we have a sloth. He flies off around the solar system. He doesn't read out. I read out three clues and then you've got to guess where he's been. Okay, but this time, hey, I'm rocking the black and white look. Ah, we haven't got a sloth, but we have got another endangered animal. We have got... <laughs> this... Is my cuddle buddy when I come back to my mum's. Her name is Betty Bamboogie. She's from Ikea, by the way. She is fantastic. Except she's got a serious, serious problem. I've cuddled her so much that all the stuffing's gone out of her arm. <laughs> She'll never fly or take off when she's got no arms. Get well soon. Yes, whoever is recovering from COVID or whatever, please, people. Yeah, mm, it is scary. It's scary. It's scary. Okay. Here come the clues. Betty Bamboogie, how was it this week? You have been somewhere fantastic. Betty Bamboogie has been looking at something. She has been looking at, this is your first clue, spectacular auroral curtains of light that rise 1,000 miles above the cloud tops. That's a good clue, isn't it, Betty? Clue number two. Let me get my banners on. Don't like it when it just says my name there. Um, there it is. Clue number two. These displays are caused by an energetic wind from the sun, but they're invisible to our eyes. 
And clue number three, images reveal ripples and overall patterns that evolve slowly with local brightening and they exhibit rapid variations on time scales of minutes. So basically, where could we be? What are we doing? <laughs> the arms are funny, aren't they? <laughs> I'm sorry, Betty. Oh, she looks a bit like Patrick Moore there, like that. Um, so we are looking at spectacular auroral curtains of light that rise a thousand miles above the cloud tops. These displays are caused by an energetic wind from the sun, but they're invisible to our eyes. Images reveal ripples and overall patterns that evolve slowly with local brightening. They exhibit rapid variations on a time scale of minutes. Okay, the answers are coming in. Aurora, we need more information than that. North Cape. Where's North Cape? Is it down in the Southern Hemisphere somewhere? I'm afraid you are wrong, Ray Ward. Anybody else? Somebody's got it right, but I'm not going to reveal the answer just yet. Did you enjoy your trip there, Betty Bamboogie? Yes, she certainly did. We are going to unplug, tidy up the mayhem that we have caused in Mother's sitting room, switch the pictures back around that I've ripped off the wall so you could have a nice um, astro picture and um, a parrot. It's not a parrot, it's a cockatoo. Okay, Mel says Jupiter. Adrian Bateman says uh, the Aurora Borealis. Madeline says Neptune. Um, I would love to see the show one day. At least meet the team. Ah, oh, <laughs> you can come and see us. Europa, I'm afraid, Ian, you are wrong. Um, we've got half an answer. Half an answer correct. Aurora Borealis. Borealis. <laughs> Um, somebody's got half an answer correct, but I want the full answer. It could be, don't like saying that planet's name. Oh, Northern ext extremity of mainland Europe, Aurora, often seen there. Listen to the clues. Looking at spectacular auroral curtains of light that rise a thousand miles above the cloud tops. Do our Aurora go that high in, in the UK, in great, it, it, in the world, in the, uh, on the, right. It's been an hour now. It's a long time to be on air. Time to wrap it up. Sean Follard says, Mars, I'm afraid you are wrong. Oh, Paul, let me just put you back on. Are you ready to come back on, Paul? Paul, yep. you've just dropped me an answer in the private chat and you have completely got it absolutely correct. And I do believe... You should have got it right. Neil Sanders. Hi, Neil. You're right there. Jupiter, how do I so how do I get into the private bit, the um chat on screen? How do I type I, into that? Th you need to be on Facebook, my dear. All right. Now then, you're the only person to get it right. Let me just scroll through. Apologies if anybody else got it right. Somebody got the planet right, but they didn't get the full thing right. So what did you say? Saturnian Aurora. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the plural correct. Thank you so much. And John Morell, you got it right as well. Yeah, they are beautiful, massive, spectacular aurora visible in UV only. Uh, there's a Hubble instrument that detects them that has 10 times the sensitivity of previous Hubble instruments in the ultraviolet. There we have so it. very good. Did you enjoy tonight's show, Paul? I did. Brilliant. Absolutely. Oh, Robert Bush says the North Pole of Saturn as well. Thank you. Uh, is it the hexagon that's at the South Pole? That's a, 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 I've got a funny feeling the hexagon's on both of them, isn't it? Because it's a... It's oh, a is it? It might be. I don't know. But I, I think it, it's always seen on the top. So would, you would say it would be the North. Um, I'm not sure about that one. Betty, what do you think? She wasn't looking. She didn't no. see it. Paul, thank you so much for this evening's show. I'm going to wind it up now. Um, just give a plug for the Society once more. The South East Kent Astronomical Society. CCAS for short. Give us a look up and say hello. You can also listen to me on Deal Radio. I do a Starman thing on my local radio station. Oh, fantastic. That's always, always good to get involved in your local yeah. radio station. If you, if you it... Send me your details and I'll give, I'll give this a plug on, on my radio show. Oh, thank you. Well, I'll send you a link to this. And, yeah, send um, me a link and all the details of what, exactly when you're on, and I'll give you a plug. Oh, listen, I'm just going to read out one last thing. 
By the way, I've loved the show. Thank you. It's a great community here and lots of regulars in the chat room to be friend, uh, especially that I've been into watching stars for 10 years now. I'm so happy to be part of this community. That is what we like. Thank you, everybody. Night, Vicky. See you next week. Um, the RES has, oh, three days of observing mm, uh, Aurora in infrared last week. Yes, and we did publicise that. That's great. Oh, I did have a nice chat with Neil from Go Stargazing. Great to catch up. Thank you very much. Let's go now. See you later, Paul. Thank you. Bye, Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.